impact. We're trashing our planet. We're consuming and exhuming finite resources at a remorseless rate. We're looting and polluting and no one's disputing. It's insanely unsustainable. Now, we all know that. We know that we're rubbish at rubbish and we know what we need to do to get better at waste management. Reduce, reuse, recycle. And yet the problems continue to pile up just as if individual cities, universities, governments all think it's someone else's job to dispose of them. Now today, rather than picking over the mess we're already made, we're concentrating on the cleanup, not only reducing, reusing and recycling, but also reimagining, repurposing and re-inspiring. Reimagining the practical steps to take, repurposing misdirected good intentions and re-inspiring all those individuals and institutions so busy cutting through the excess packaging of the everyday, they aren't doing the little things that could and should make a big difference. Yeah, I'm really excited to be here and talking to you all in Algeria. Um, and we're talking uh, down the line uh, with, which involves a huge amount of electronics and information. Uh, I've got my laptop here. I've also got next to me my phone in case this one falls over. So I've got electronic gear in my life. You have your end, I'm assuming. And this is something I'd like to talk to you about uh, as we move towards questions in the panel meeting. But I, I, I think that, you know, a smartphone and perhaps laptops are pretty standard fare, I think, for university students and university academics. But what I want to talk to you about today is the waste that is produced and, and can we can we stem the tide because it is a tsunami of electronic waste that the, the, that the, uh, the world is producing at the moment. And more, more CO2 emissions are emitted during the production of phones and, and laptops and TVs than is ever emitted during their use. So it's the production of them that really has a huge environmental impact in terms of CO2 emissions. But that's not the only thing. Of course, if you think about it, uh, and maybe you have never thought about it, but let me let me talk you through it. A phone has half, more than half of the periodic table in it. So periodic table is a catalogue of all the elements that we know exist in the universe. It's roughly about 100, 106 if you insist. And, um, and half of them are in here. Now, where do we get them from? Well, we got them from mines all around the world, including Algeria, uh, and um, they've all been, you know, dug out of the ground, tons and tons of ore, loads of energy for that. And often the working conditions are not so great either in many places, particularly if you're talking about things like cobalt and gold in Africa, but also lithium uh, in, in South America. So these minerals and mines are not um, ethically kind of uh, perhaps, you know, completely to be exonerated, but then it all comes together. It's made into components that's made into electronics. And then the magic happens, the assembly, and you get this piece of kit in your life, which is revolutionary. There's no doubt about it. And it opens up the whole world. But the average life of a smartphone is very short. So all of that effort goes to what? It goes to essentially a whole, um, mindset amongst electronics companies and increasingly in the world of consumption of let's get the latest newest one <laughs> throw this one out because the next one's going to make me feel a lot better about myself i'm going to have more power but in truth the, the, what it really is doing is creating a mountain of waste a mountain of co2 emissions lots of water being used that shouldn't be used and a lot of money being being held in in the hands of very few billionaires so all of this is is i'm just I'm just elaborating the problem. Now, the UK is the, the highest emitter of electric waste in the world per person. So we don't have anything to, you know, to, to teach anyone else in the world about this. We're the worst. And what we're doing in our project is trying to understand how we can get a repair culture back in the UK. We used to have one and it's it's the easiest way to cut our CO2 emissions in terms of electric waste but it's going to be difficult for us because of consumption. But I want to talk to you because I know in Africa and I'm not sure about Algeria, but I'm sure it is on your campus that you actually do already have a healthy repair culture and we want to learn from you. So I'm all ears actually, because this is something the West really needs to learn from Africa. Very nice, Mark. And yeah, I mean, it's an interesting point that you make, obviously. There's, there's several points. I mean, people are going to be picking up the, you know, the take home fact is, 
half the periodic table is in your phone. But there's a danger there that almost glamorizes it's like, oh, I must get myself a new phone because now it's not just a phone, it's half the periodic table as well. And you're obviously right that we've had this repair culture and we don't have this repair culture. But isn't it always hard technologically to go backwards once we know we don't need to? How do you get us to think that we need to change the value we put on repair? Because we talk about, you know, oh, that's patched up. Oh, that's secondhand. Oh, that's reconditioned. That's pre-loved. How do we change it to make it seem that actually I'm prouder of having something that's been repaired than something that's brand new? I, I, I think that is the big challenge here. I think there's both an economic um, uh, driver, which is at the moment in the UK, a lot of things are, are cheaper to buy new than they are to get repaired. And that's because the, the price you have to pay for someone qualified who is knowledgeable to repair a kettle, a phone, a toaster, a, a, a laptop, the price per hour means that after a couple of hours, you might as well have bought a new one. And this is this is an economic driver which I think needs to be addressed in terms of pricing the waste. So the waste is not being priced into this equation. So it, it looks like it's only an issue of price per hour, but actually you're avoiding a certain amount of waste and that that, that waste has to be added to the, the calculation. So that's an economic issue. The other thing is, of course, cultural, which is we want the latest, greatest, newest, thingest, biggest thing. <laughs> and that that is something that is also kind of um, a 20th century appetite, a bit like eating lots of meat that we've kind of got used to. I don't think that is, we can't, I think we can walk back from that. I think culture and fashion, I mean, for a while ago, you know, if, 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 if I said to you, ripped jeans is cool, you'd be like, what? Ripped jeans? Cool? What are you talking about? But ripped jeans are cool, you know, like who knew? <laughs> and there are there are some countries that have managed to kind of keep this going along. I, I remember being in New Zealand and they have this phrase here that you may have come across called the number eight wire mentality which is the kind of that used to be the belief from the old days of the kind of pioneers that almost anything could be repaired with a bit of this wire and a bit of in, a bit of ingenuity. And they take pride in that idea to this day that we don't need to get a new thing. We can repair what we've got. So if you can change the mental perspective around this, then you get the behavioural change rather than this just being a kind of ideological goal that people say they mean to do, but they never get around to doing. Yeah, I mean, um, and on that front, I, mean, I think having a, a phone that you can change the battery without voiding the warranty is is a kind of is is a kind of is a step number one. So I've got a phone called a Fairphone, but it's one of the few phones in the UK which is sold on the basis that it's repairable, and you can buy all the parts, and they want you to repair it. And so I can take pride in having this ten years later. Ah, uh, <laughs> yes, Paolo's got one too. Paolo's but, holding it. Up. Great. But you've got other companies, big ones, Samsung, Apple, which are gluing in their their um, components. And, and I think that there is a, there is a role here for government and we have the right to repair movement in the EU, in the EU and in the UK, which is basically a, a bit of legislation forcing companies to make things repairable. And I think there is, you know, we, we're trying to protect the commons, i.e. the environment and the world. And to protect a common value and a, and a common uh, resources, we have to, I think governments have a big role. But I'd be interested in what people say about this in Algeria. So uh, basically just a quick walkthrough on the Algerian uh, recycling ecosystem. We Algerians, as uh, many uh, consumer uh, uh, communities, have evolved since the industrial revolution following uh, a linear economical uh, scheme, which is that we are taking resources manufacturing products, using products, and end up disposing of the products. Each time we go all over this line, we finish up with more waste and lesser resources, which is highly unsustainable, as you know. Uh, the latest uh, the World, World Wildlife Foundation report shows that 95% of the floating debris in the Mediterranean Sea is plastic, and of course, it is coming from the land. So, which is not very pretty, I uh, think, um, to brag about, if I may say so. Algeria, to tell you a few numbers about waste in Algeria, Algeria is producing around uh, uh, 11 million uh, tons per domestic waste per year, while only recycling 10% of them. These 10% get recycled throughout this magical, as I like to call it, process called circular economy, which is a process that mimics nature uh, and that makes it so that nothing is lost and everything is transformed. If we zoom in on the local recycling economy in Algeria, 
we find that there is the consumers which deposit unsorted waste in the common uh, trash bin. There are uh, a few informal collectors, which are people who come and scavenge uh, the trash to get the recyclables and to transport them to the recycling companies. So this is the premises on, on which we started uh, building realistically. We asked, we asked each one of these segments, why aren't you guys recycling more than 10%? So for the consumers, most of them didn't know the proper way to sort. And for those who knew how to sort waste, they didn't have direct access to the recycling industry. So they, 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 they didn't have like uh, this tool to contribute. We also asked the, the informal collectors, why aren't you guys making more than 10%? Uh, manual sorting is a uh, time and effort consuming. And also, since they go and scavenge the common trash bin, they only get the, the, the higher parts of it. Which then led us to the recycling industry. We were like, why aren't you guys recycling more than 10% of domestic waste? And most of the answer, uh, answers were that they were not receiving enough input. So they are waiting there with cash in hand, waiting for the informers to come and to give them uh, uh, the uh, the recyclables for them to start the recycling cycle. Recycling, as uh, most people know, is an industrial process. It has its costs and it has its downsides. So this is where we decided to create Nordicycle, a platform that links the consumers to their local recycling industry. They subscribe on a website, they get free training on uh, waste sorting, and they get directed to the nearest collection point, to where they deposit their waste, they gain points from them, and then they can later on uh, exchange these points for products and services provided by one of our partners. The platform is also uh, targeting informal collectors by formalizing them, training them, equipping them with uh, safety equipment and giving them a map so they can go out there and get uh, the most of most recyclables with lesser efforts. The recyclables are already sorted, dry and compacted. So really, when it comes to uh, the Algerian uh, recycling ecosystem, for us, it's really uh, um, we put an emphasis on uh, the optimization of uh, of the ecosystem. We believe that once we get the ecosystem optimized, once we get enough products to incentivize more users to sort uh, their waste at home and to deposit at uh, the local collection points, once we get more small businesses uh, on board as collection points, uh, points playing this role as a part-time job, we believe that this loop can sustain itself and uh, uh, play an effective role against the plastic pollution we see uh, in Algeria. So we have uh, only uh, developed a better version of it. We are targeting the central region of Algeria. As you mentioned, Algeria, you can say, is a continent. So as for now, we are doing some tests in order to optimize uh, this process throughout the middle uh, uh, the the middle part of Algeria, and uh, later on we believe in a, in a bottom-up approach to where uh, each time we go into a new location, we develop a small ecosystem, we uh, make it so that the ecosystem sustains itself, and then later on we connect uh, the multiple ecosystems. The platform was only launched six months ago, and uh, we haven't done any marketing, we wanted to really test uh, test the tool for what it is. We haven't done any important marketing or anything, and we are we have already more than 3,000 uh, uh, active users on the platform. So uh, uh, also we started the, the building the platform on the premises that Algerians don't want to recycle. So we, we, we were believing that it either takes a tax to get them to recycle or to give them goodies. To take them to make them recycle, and then and then later on, uh, we, uh, uh, we we figured out that actually Algerians were uh, an ancient civilization uh, on waste sorting and recycling. And I can give you uh, an example. Most Algerians uh, uh, in the life will recognize them. Uh, basically, uh, as you might know, uh, the Algerian diet is uh, 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 has a lot of uh, bread in it. We use a lot of bread. We often buy more than what we need, which eventually gets into an environmental problem. Well, Algerians have this uh, approach to bread to where it is uh, uh, regarded as sacred. So in each neighborhood, they have this place where they put uh, uh, the, the cold bread, as we call it. 
the, the unconsumed bread, they put it. And then the, there was the, this informal market of people getting their bread and reselling it to the people uh, who are uh, from the farming industry. So actually, uh, we, we were believing that we were building something new, but what we were really doing is imitating this ancient practice uh, embedded in the Algerian culture. <laughs> Um, I'm going to give you a little bit of a, uh, um, my kind of uh, potted history very quickly, and then I'll talk very specifically about um, sort of key aspects of implementing waste uh, waste management in uh, university settings. So um, I've my past is I've worked for the Environment Agency, which is our the the main uh, regulatory body for uh, for the uh, for England and Wales, and. Um, for, for 15 years and then after that I've spent time at University of Southampton and University of Bournemouth in roles that have involved me in implementing comprehensive waste management systems. Um, so the, the three things I'm going to really talk about here are that I think are fundamental building blocks of, of uh, for implementing sound waste management practices at an institution. The first is the strategic level, and it's really important to embed the um, environmental management within the st strategy of the organisation. My experience has been if it's not aligned with what with the direction of the organisation, you can still make progress, but it just is really hard work. And we were successful at Bournemouth to, to get one of the four key outcomes of the institution uh, to be sustainability. And when we talk about sustainability, we also made quite a step change and we talk about sustainability in terms of the United Nations Sustainable Development Goals, which I'm hoping you may well have heard about uh, because they are really comprehensive um, and give you an opportunity to have a conversation with people about sustainability that frankly was really difficult before. Uh, and we can touch on that for the reasons why that in, in, the, in the chat. Um, so that's the, that's the first element. That's, then you've got to translate that strategy into reality on the ground. And um, for that, we found that if you have a framework, it works so much better. And the framework we chose was the International Standard for Environmental Management Systems, um, and that's ISO 14001. And there are three elements of ISO 14001 which really play out, um, not only for waste management, but across the piece. So they are the, the, the three pillars. The first is prevention of pollution. The second is compliance uh, with legislation and other elements. And the third is continual improvement. And they are absolutely essential to getting the building blocks right. The other element that we used was that uh, we had a collaborative approach um, along the South Coast. So seven universities and colleges all share the same recycling contract. And that brings with it great benefits because uh, first of all, it meant the value of the contract, because we do go to a private provider for our, our waste management services. It gives you much greater leverage in terms of what you can get uh, from the industry sector. Um, but it also means, that, of course, you can, can work out what, uh, share best practice between yourselves. So I would recommend that for a really effective way to go about uh, implementing uh, waste management uh, on campuses. And the third, of course, is uh, element is people. Um, and that's people both in terms of the corporate level of the organisation, but also the individual. And the corporate level, which is the bit I worked out, was really is about putting in place the processes and the, the infrastructure, basically the bins, to make it as easy as possible for staff, students and visitors to our campus to recycle. And um, so that's, that, that's our part of the bargain. And then, of course, we have to encourage uh, those individuals to ensure they actually put the right thing in the right bin to make the system work. And there are a lot various techniques that we've used to, 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 to get us to uh, a good uh, good point. Um, but what I would say is it's really important to say that uh, the approach to uh, waste management has evolved over time. It's, it's um, Ref, uh, reflecting, if you like, what's been happening in the UK as a whole. So the move away from landfill has definitely benefited us, as has been the investments in recycling facilities. So they have both played their part uh, in terms of being able to move us forward uh, and get a better outcome for our waste management. In terms of uh, giving people um, sort of credits for recycling is an, an approach actually that we took uh, at Bournemouth and we used a, a system called Green Rewards, 
which is a software package um, and it rewards people for positive behaviours. So that's both environmental and for their own health and well-being. And the default, one of the default elements was about recycling. So if you recycle and there are various elements uh, for recycling, you got points. And uh, sorry to be a bit corny here, but points mean prizes. <laughs> and uh, every month we gave uh, we, we had uh, we gave prizes to to our staff. Um, and we had um, up to about 60% of our staff signed up to the scheme. Um, so that was just one element, but we were also looking at ways to encourage people to not produce waste in the first place. So we had other elements we were going through, um, uh, such as taxing the use of coffee cups. Um, so we were introducing a taxation system to encourage people to reuse their own uh, mugs. Um, and we also introduced a similar kind of tax on water bottles. Um, and I think uh, Paolo has probably done something similar. A lot of universities in the UK have, have gone down a similar kind of approach um, because the whole point is that um, is that if we can avoid producing the waste in the first place, that makes our life so much easier. Um, and it also saves us money <laughs> because it's not cheap to get rid of this stuff, particularly when you're talking about um, Hazardous wastes and electronic wastes um, is expensive and therefore, um, and we pay at, at Bournemouth, it's centrally um, budgeted. So the individual doesn't pay to get rid of their waste. Um, the centre picks up the tab. So in terms of an incentive, it becomes quite difficult to get, to get people unless you, as I say, tax them, if you like, at the product stage. And that's that's really where when I was talking about evolution is that really what we need to focus on is not so much the three R's or whether it's useful, it's the rethink bit at the front end. So that's rethinking about what products we actually have uh, on offer um, and also how we encourage people to to go down that route um, about changing their habits. Um, and we've done a lot of work around that, um, particularly around um, nudges as they are known, uh, to, encourage, in, to encourage people to do uh, to do that, go down that route. I'm perhaps going to add a little bit to what Neil said. Um, so the, the first I will start off by saying is that, you know, many of the things we do in the UK um, are only possible because of the way waste is regulated in the UK and that things might be a little bit different where you are. However, there's a number of principles that apply regardless of where you are. Uh, so the, the first that we've, we've followed is, is that we try and reduce the environmental impact and health impacts associated with treating our waste. And, and the second is once that is in place, we, we then begin working on a transition to uh, the principles of, of the circular economy. Um, so at GCU, we, we have about 5,000 tonnes of, of waste a year. That's about uh, 100 rubbish bin trucks. 80% um, of it is from a campus in the centre of Glasgow. And, and um, I suppose the rest is from some student residencies. We have uh, 660 room and uh, a small satellite campus in London. Um, we, we manage our waste according to the principles of the waste hierarchy uh, and many of the tools we've adopted and the interventions we've made, they're not novel in their own right, but many years on they, they, they are beginning to show a cumulative effect. Um, so we do things like um, to reduce the environmental impact and financial costs of our waste. We, we um, have worked quite hard to develop an, an understanding of what is in our waste and this is from broad quantities that our waste contractor provides us but our own waste analysis so we sit and we sift through our waste once a year to understand what is being recycled and what more importantly what isn't being recycled. Uh, we continuously invite feedback from our community from students and staff and visitors in what we could do better um, we, we train staff formally and informally uh, and, and we draw on this also uh, with our um, environmental management system ISO 14001. 
uh, we choose waste contractors or we're now in a position where we can work with waste contractors that keep most of the waste within the UK. A lot of it gets sent to for processing and separating and sorting in, in countries that perhaps have less strong controls as the UK, but we've we managed to keep uh, the, the, the sort of the nastier parts in the UK. And we focused on focusing on, on uh, reducing waste streams as, as well. So um, we do process reviews. So, um, you know, we, we with the digitalization of our operations, you know, students need to print less assignments because they're submitted online and, and our governance team that manage the, the university leadership's uh, work, they, they've gone to an online system um, so they don't print thousands and thousands of sheets of paper. Uh, we're removing printers for example and we're in the process of removing 700 printers from 1400 staff to about a hundred. Um, not without its contention. People are some people are not happy about it. We we look at how we manage stock. So our, our chemists, they've moved from large quantities or large containers for chemicals in their labs to very small containers. And they can do that because there are supply chains that um, can deliver these things quickly. But the, the positive side is if they drop a container, they don't lose all of it. They, they just lose a little bit and the containers are made of plastic. So the chances of breaking are, are reduced. Um, we look at prolonging uh, equipment uh, reuse. Um, ideally, our own equipment with us, but also making equipment we don't need available to others for reuse. And, and uh, we look at substituting materials. So we look at what in our operations is a waste and what could we remove? So when we had a new catering contractor, we replaced 27,000 uh, bottles of milk, plastic bottles of milk, with these pouches of the milk. And, and although the plastic the, that contains the milk cannot be recycled, the cardboard around it can, and it frees up a lot of space in, in our waste container. So we can you know, maybe get more out of them. And we also have financial incentives. So from charges for uh, single use items like coffee cups um, to penalizing our waste contractor or anyone that puts the wrong type of waste in the wrong container. And this was mainly used as a leverage for our caterer that would put large quantities of food waste in the recycling bin. So we did training, but then when that didn't work as well as it could, we started charging them. Um, we we um, I think in terms of next stages, we're, we're trying to look at supply chain. So the, the things that are brought in and, and an example that um, I'm focusing on at the moment or trying to focus on is we buy stationary pens, paper, etc. And they come uh, twice a week in a box and we have to recycle the box. And I'm trying to get our stationary provider to send that material in a paper bag, which is much lighter than the box. Uh, and cheaper for us to recycle. But at the moment, we're having some legacy investment issues because they've spent a lot of money in an automated packing facility that puts everything in the box and they don't want to get rid of the box. Um, so what's what? where have uh, all these uh, measures taken us? So we're at about 5,000 tons. That's a 30% reduction since about 2014-15. We recycle 70% of our waste, about 40% of that is upfront, so it's what we do, and the remainder is our contractor, and we uh, send no waste to landfill. So that's just by following simple steps that Neil started alluding to, um, we've had a reasonable impact. If we collaborate with others, it becomes uh, even more powerful. Um, so uh, in Glasgow, most of our universities or higher and further education institutions, so universities and, and colleges, we share the same waste contractor. We don't share the same waste contract, but with a little bit of planning, we probably could. And, and you know, you can hold a lot of leverage that way, as, as Neil was saying, in terms of the services they provide. So, for example, we, we although we sell some types of pallets that um, end up on campus, we don't sell all of them. So the others end up going for recycling. Now, if the seven of us in Glasgow could work together, 
the waste contractor could probably dedicate a vehicle to collecting pallets or other materials and um, well other procurement contracts as well but that is it we are done and dust carted for today uh, thanks again to everyone for the sustained quality of the conversation participation organization and i hope inspiration next time round, we move on to the city and focus on our increasingly urban lives and how universities can help ensure that just because we're in built up areas we don't build up emissions and waste à la prochaine au revoir and thank you for today bye